follow up. Thank you, Madam Chair. Do you see a difference between freedom of speech and hate speech? You're recognized. Well, hate speech is a problematic concept as I understand it because as I mentioned here, the affirmation of freedom of speech is that we need to tolerate speech even if it is deeply offensive to us. So if someone says something that is uh, received by the, one of the listeners as hateful, we still have to let them say that, as long as they don't take action, specific actions, to harm someone. Now that, that is bad if someone says something hateful and it's perfectly reasonable to condemn what they say. The question here is do they have a right to say it? And what I tried to argue in my presentation is that the very real um, problem of having to listen to someone who says something that you think is hateful is still less than the problem of trying to suppress their speech and trying to figure out where to draw the line between what is illegitimate and hateful speech and what is not because it's a very hard line to draw and once we start doing that we get into suppressing free speech so the price for free speech overall is as Justice Holmes said freedom for the thought that we hate one more follow-up thank you um, and this is a really important issue so thank you madam chair for giving us the flexibility to ask some really important questions about a, a topic that is really hot right now around college campuses around the country. I'm concerned because I see over and over again hate speech that is uh, inciting violence on college campuses uh, and in other venues around the country. And what's happening is that the folks who are, are perpetrating this type of hate speech are framing it as freedom of speech. We have seen incidences in campuses in the state of Florida. Uh, at the University of Central Florida in the district that I represent in East Orlando where anti-Semitic posters and stickers and flyers have been recently posted in bulletin boards across college uh, across the college campus that included swastikas the star of David and the groups that put these flyers up made a defense that it was their freedom of speech to do so uh, and even the website that was listed on these flyers that were posted around uni on this university campus said that the goal of their organization was to promote a white America that is Muslim free. Do you believe that this type of speech is protected by your model legislation as freedom of speech? I, I believe it is representative. I'm, I'm a Jewish myself. I, I lost relatives in the Holocaust and uh, I would condemn <coughs> swastikas and I would hope that others would openly condemn that but I would not take away their right to do it because that's what actually takes us down the dangerous path to civil strife and potential authoritarianism so it's worth it to put up with the difficulty in my view of free speech and free speech is a difficulty and it does take self-mastery it does take self-control and it does involve sacrifice uh, but it's worth it in the end. The consequences for not going down that route are much greater. But that does not mean that these things cannot be condemned. And frankly, in my view, people who run around saying uh, openly anti-Semitic things and putting up swastikas pretty much discredit themselves. And, and I think that when, when, people, when people act like that, the great majority of people run screaming in the other direction, basically. And I think that's the effective way to get that them, rather than turning them into some kind of martyr. One quick follow-up, please, Madam Chair. Last follow-up. Thank you. Um, what my, I have many concerns about much of what I just heard from your presentation, namely among them, the ability of students to respond to such hate speech in ways that are peaceful, uh, in peaceful demonstrations, because you talked about at, at some point uh, the, the necessity of the Board of Governors to, to pass a, a statewide university standard that would restrict the ability of, of students to, to protest uh, and peacefully demonstrate. How, do, how does your model legislation interact with the rights of those students to right. respond to some of this hate, what I see as hate right. speech, which does incite violence 
against minority students. Right. Well, actually, the legislation explicitly protects the right to peaceful protest. What would not be permitted is if a speaker comes and he's shouted down so that people in the audience can't hear him speak. Let me give an example. I've mentioned on a number of occasions, because it is the classic statement of campus free speech, the Woodward Report. Woodward is C. Van Woodward, a famous uh, historian. Uh, and in fact, C. Van Woodward uh, was considered by Martin Luther King uh, the uh, core historian of the civil rights movement. He is a liberal, and he was a classic liberal. And C. Van Woodward wrote this report when Yale disinvited George C. Wallace in the early 60s at the height of his crusade to protect segregation. And yet, C. Van Woodward, a liberal, who was the shining intellectual light of the civil rights movement and Martin Luther King, felt that it was necessary for the sake of free speech in the country at large to protect the right of George C. Wallace, even George C. Wallace, the segregationist, to speak. And that, I think, is a very positive model for us to follow. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. And um, thank you again for allowing the time for us to have an honest discussion about something that's really, really important, because there are heightened tensions on university campuses around the country. There are heightened tensions that have to do with um, with xenophobia and racism and bigotry and what I'm concerned is that many aspects of your free speech proposal will have some unintended consequences. You said you don't know what they are. I, I know what they are, what the unintended consequences are. They are increased hostility towards minority students and minority faiths as well. When, when universities make the decision that they have the power to make to not give provocateurs and folks who promote hate speech a large platform, they're doing so for many reasons. They're doing so because they have safety concerns for their students, which should not be overridden by a model policy or, or state legislative policy. They are doing so also because as a university, they have a moral obligation with the student population that they are trying to educate and educate many of these young minds, they have a moral obligation to not normalize bigotry and normalize hatred towards others. And that's what Smith. so many of these are. Smith. So my question. Yes, thank you. My question is, is there any part of your plan that would promote cultural awareness for these students to counteract what some of the unintended consequences can be. Because there is one example that again happened at UCF uh, that is a consequence, an unintended consequence of hate speech that is unchecked. Uh, it was about a year and a half ago on campus at UCF, there was a false report that there was a Middle Eastern gunman in the library of the University of Central Florida. The whole campus went on lockdown. It was a false report, and the false report had to do with ignorance. It was a student who posted on social media, who went into the stairway, who saw a Muslim student wearing a hijab, praying quiet, quietly in the stairwell. And then she went and posted that there was a Middle Eastern gunman on campus, and the whole thing, but this whole incident was created because of ignorance that is promoted by hate speech. So what does your model legislation do to address that? Well, I would say a couple of things, Representative. First of all, you mentioned that at, at the beginning that several, several of these th uh, things that universities now are doing, they have the prerogative to do. I would argue that they do not have that prerogative. I would argue that they have both a legal and moral obligation to enforce the First Amendment, which is already, as noted with the uh, earlier uh, representative already legally applies to the university. So actually, they're not doing what they have the prerogative to do. But I, I really believe, as I said in my talk, that freedom of speech and the principles behind it and the First Amendment are the greatest way for us to increase tolerance. And we're making a mistake by not having free speech. We think we're protecting people 
when in fact, if you let people say what they're going to say, eventually the people who hate will be shamed and rejected. And by teaching students, and this only goes a small way toward that, but it does go some way, because the, this uh, statement on the principles of free expression would be taught to students at freshman orientation. And I believe when they're taught the basic principles of free speech, that ultimately gives a message of tolerance. Yes, it allows for offensive speech, but ultimately the purpose of free speech, and by the way, I, I, this is not in the legislation, but I would like to see trustees and administrators uh, assign John Stuart Mills on liberty as the common reading. I don't know if you're familiar with common reading, but nowadays colleges and universities, after uh, students have been admitted, they're all asked to read uh, the same book in the summer just before they come in for their uh, freshman year. This is not an assignment from a class, but from the university as a whole. And I think if you would read, if they would read John Stuart Mill's On Liberty instead of some of the political and ide ideological tracts that they're generally assigned about the principles of free speech, the idea behind it is that if you don't have someone around uh, to, uh, to argue against your own case, you, you have to invent it. You have to bring them in because you don't even know what you believe unless you hear what someone who disagrees with you believes. And in the end, I think that creates calm and respect by people on all sides toward the others. Whereas if you silence people, then you make them resentful and you're likely to stoke their hatred even more. I think free speech works. I think it creates civility. I think it's worked for America for 200 years. And the problem now is we're turning away from it. And we think that's solving the problem. But look at the problem. It's only getting worse. We're more divided now than we ever were. And we're less into free speech than we've ever been. I think that's not a coincidence.